Good evening, and welcome to the Canadian Federation of Agriculture's Agriculture Leaders Debate. My name is Kelsey Johnson. I am a journalist with Reuters, and it's my great honor to be your moderator tonight. Before we begin introductions and review tonight's debate format, I would like to note that the Canadian Federation of Agriculture is the national voice of more than 200,000 Canadian farmers and farm families. I would also like to recognize and thank tonight's debate sponsor, Food and Consumer Products of Canada. The overarching theme of tonight's debate is producing prosperity. Tonight's questions will be focused on three pillars of CFA's Producing Prosperity in Canada campaign, economic growth, environmental stewardship, and food security. Canada's agriculture sector is the country's second largest employer, accounting for one in eight jobs. It contributes more than $140 billion to Canada's GDP. The issues that will be discussed tonight are not only significant for our agricultural communities, but for all Canadians. Before we begin, here are the ground rules. Prior to tonight's event, candidates drew to determine the order in which they will speak. Each debater will be given up to two minutes for their opening statements. There will be four questions to start, followed by a four-question rapid-fire round. We'll then take a brief break, after which we'll conclude with the final four questions and closing remarks. Each debater will be given up to a maximum of two minutes per question to respond, followed by two minutes of open debate. The rapid-fire round will require a yes or no answer, and after all participants have answered, they will each be given 30 seconds to either expand on their answer or respond to one of their fellow participants. The closing remarks will be up to one minute in length and will be delivered in the reverse order of opening remarks. I would like to note that this evening's debate will be simultaneously translated. You can view tonight's debate on CFA's YouTube and Facebook page. For those following along at home, you can also join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag AgDebate. I would now like to introduce our candidates who have all graciously accepted tonight's invitation. Representing the New Democratic, New Democratic Party of Canada, Mr. Alistair McGregor. From the Green Party, Ms. Kate Storey. From the Liberal Party of Canada, the Honourable Marie-Claude Bibeau. Good evening. Party of Canada, Mr. Luc Bertold. Bonsoir. Good evening. Since Mr. McGregor won the draw to begin opening remarks, you can now start with your opening remarks. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to give a special shout out to all of the farmers across this great country from coast to coast to coast who are tuning in tonight to listen to the respective parties who are putting forward their vision for agriculture in Canada. I myself am proud to have a small farming property out on Vancouver Island, a riding that represent that has many different farmers and many different industries that, uh, that work together. And I think when we go ahead looking at agriculture in the future, we see that there are a lot of challenges before us, but also a great many opportunities. First and foremost, we know that the issue of climate change is going to be a major issue. In fact, during my time as the vice chair on the Standing Committee on Agriculture, we heard repeatedly from farmers who expressed in the very strongest terms that they are on the front lines of climate change, where, whether it's droughts or floods, unpredictable weather. We also have to look at a changing dynamic in the international scene. Our markets are sometimes not as sure as they used to be, and many countries are taking to non-tariff trade barriers to disrupt the flow of our goods, which we know are of the highest quality. And so that's something that a future government has to take note of and has to be very proactive on. At the same time though, we know that our farmers are at the cutting edge of technology and the, the greatest methods for planting their crops and looking after them. We know what we have some of the highest food safety standards in anywhere in the world and we should be proud of the work that our farmers do every day to put a great name beside our country. So with that, I am looking forward to tonight's debate with my colleagues. I think we're going to have some great discussions, and I think we can all agree that no matter what party we're from, we all value agriculture, we respect the work that you do, and we're here to listen to you going forward. Thank you. Ms. Story. Thank you. I'm uh, here res representing the Green Party tonight. But last week, I was sitting on a combine. And uh, that day, my husband was bringing the, the grain truck up, 
so I could unload the grain from the combine into the truck. And all of a sudden, there was a fire underneath the, the truck. It was a hot day, a bit of straw had touched the, the exhaust, and we were on fire. So he threw the truck into gear, got it out of the way. I threw the combine in gear, got it out of the way, remembering, fortunately, to shut the grain off that was still flowing on the ground. And so he ran and got the cultivator and started making a fire guard. I called 911, got the fire department, and they came and they kept the fire from jumping the road to our neighbors. And the point of telling you this is because Farm families need communities. We need our neighbor. We, we need our neighbors. We need our schools. We need our health care. We need our stores. And we, we need that volunteer fire department. And agriculture policy has to keep enough people on the rural landscape so that farm families have communities. So Greens want to make farm policy that works for those farm families, rural communities. We want to bring in regenerative agriculture, expand our domestic market, and have more smaller, more diverse farms that get more people back into food production. Our green platform is the only one that provides a plan to actually reduce greenhouse gases by half in 10 years while creating jobs and helping farms to prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Story. Uh, Madame Bibo, your opening remarks. Thank you, Kelsey. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, the representatives uh, from Can the Canadian Federation of Agriculture for organising this debate, which is crucial. Over recent years, I've had the privilege of delving deep into these various issues that affect the sector and to take stock of the quality of our uh, products uh, and our top quality food system has made strategic, smart and sustainable investments in the sector and has raised the profile of agriculture and agri-food as one of the top sectors for economic growth. And by undertaking key recommendations outlined in the Agri-Food Economic Strategy Table and Barton Report, we set ambitious goals for the sector and started, started putting them into action. I certainly recognize that there are some tough challenges, and that's why we are working to ensure that the right tools are in place to help manage these risks. We know that market diversification is key in expanding our opportunities. We have put in place trade agreements that open markets to two-thirds of the global economy, and we have supported our producers and processors and invested in research, science, and innovation to better position our industry in the domestic and global market. The Liberal team of Canada believes strongly in the value of the supply management system. We're going to continue to assure its success for future generations. As the first female Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada, I care very much about ensuring that women and girls and under, unrepresent, underrepresented groups uh, find their place around the decision-making table for a prosperous future. And uh, Monsieur Bertold, your opening remarks, please. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'm delighted also to be here this evening for this Canadian Federation of Agriculture debate. It's the first of its kind with the two major leaders of the agriculture sector being women, Mary Robertson, the first female president of the Federation from in eastern Quebec and eastern Canada, uh, Madame Bibo, the first female minister, for having broken through this glass ceiling. That's crucial. Agriculture it's changing, it's evolving, and it is a business of all Canadians. And I'm delighted to be here with you this evening to talk about an issue that I care very much about and one of which I'm very proud. I'm the critic for the Conservative Party and have been for the past two years for agriculture and agri-foods. And it's a steep learning curve. No one in Canada can claim that agriculture doesn't change anything in their lives. From the crop to the plate, we are the envy of uh, uh, others abroad. 
we wouldn't have uh, vegetables, grains, meat, anything else without Canadian farmers. In our towns and cities, we have a direct link with agricultures, and unfortunately, all too often, this link is overlooked. What we eat every day, what we consume, is the fruit of the labour of hard-working farmers across Canada to ensure that we have good quality food. And I have visited far more rural regions than just towns. And Canada was built by these farmers, these producers, and they represent the future of Canada. Agriculture will take an increasingly important place uh, uh, for the future of Canada and for both uh, federal and uh, provincial and territorial governments. The world is changing. We have big challenges before us, uh, uh, given climate change, which is affecting the uh, way of life of producers. And it's crucial to ensure prosperity that agriculture be a top priority of the next government. And that's what the Conservative Party of Canada intends to do. Thank you all for your opening statements. It is now time for the fun to begin. Here is our first question. Agriculture and food processing is the largest manufacturing sector in Canada, contributing over $140 billion to Canada's GDP. Meanwhile, global demand for food is projected to increase by 50% by 2050. If elected to form the next government, what would your party do to prioritize and promote Canadian agriculture and agri-food, both at home and abroad? Uh, Mr. McGregor, we'll start with you. Thank you very much for the question. We have a lot to be proud of in Canada, and I think our world-leading standards are first and foremost amongst them. You know, I, I, I've heard a lot from farmers over the last two years uh, regarding the pains that they sometimes suffer from the CFIA inspections, but there's also a recognition that the CFIA is what gives our international brand that prevalence that it so rightly deserves. We know that the world is expected to increase quite by quite a large number by the year 2050, and that because of the effects of climate change, many of the world's top agricultural producing regions will in fact be suffering from that, and that gives Canada a very unique opportunity. Here at home, I think we need to be looking at how we make communities much more self-reliant by establishing local food hubs, by making sure that we have that whole of government approach looking at food from the farm to the factory to the fork. By making those communities more resilient and connecting them to the local farms, we're in fact creating these little food hubs, these little oases across the country which will strengthen, I think, Canadians' food knowledge and their ability to get to, their, to know their farmer. because. What we're seeing right now is consumers are very much driving the different types of demands and standards. And I think it, it rightly serves us that we should get them to know their farmers, to know that the hard work they're doing. I think also we have to look at the emerging technologies in, in crop science, the, the gene editing, because if we're going to make plants that are going to be more resilient to climate change, we're going to have to look at strains that are actually going to be able to withstand conditions with less water and soil. And so I think that export of Canadian technology and know-how is going to be very critical to help other regions of the world get that self-sufficiency as well. But we certainly have a bright future ahead of us because of the hard work that our farmers do. And I very much look forward to encouraging that, to listening to farmers, and to always being receptive to their ideas as to where they want to go next. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Story? Thank you. So we have to ask, um, what's your priority? The World Health Organization says that climate change is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. It threatens all aspects of the society in which we live. World attitudes are changing. Students are striking. And the science is that global civilization will collapse in their lifetimes unless we rethink the human economy. Agriculture must reduce our emissions by half in the next 10 years. We can do this. Agriculture can recognize the priorities of the future. Farmers can do it, but agribusiness and politicians are continuing on with policies for business as usual. They're missing the opportunity to get Canada ahead of the global shift and protect agriculture for Canadians. Agricultural emissions are mostly from nitrogen fertilizer. And it's our job to do something to get those emissions down. We could do regenerative farming. Uh, we can, Greens will shift agriculture policy towards regenerative and 
organic techniques. We'll encourage clean energy production on the farm. We'll rebuild those food processing, processing plants that were closed by free trade. And we'll end this idea that we have to produce more and more and more to feed a world that doesn't exist yet. We're feeding enough to, to feed 10 billion people right now, and there are 7 billion in the world. 40% of food is wasted. We're wasting emissions, feeding people that don't exist. We can create a sustainable agriculture here in Canada that produces high quality food for Canadians and trades fairly with the world and respects the realities of climate change. Thank you, Ms. Story. Madame Bibo. So we already made agriculture and agri-food a priority. And we did that listening to people and working with the industry. We started by forming the Economic Advisory Council. We had the Barton Report. And we keep working you know, with the industry to make sure that the decisions we make are the best. Budget 2017 was a turning point where we really clearly identified the sector as one of the six Canadian priority. And our objective is to increase our export to $75 billion by, by 2025. For example, we listen and we started Deliver, and we will continue. We invested in modern, innovative, and sustainable uh, agreement with the provinces for, uh, to support the industry, what we all call CAP. We in reinvested significantly in research, science, innovation, because we know our farmers and our processors need to stay on, at the cutting edge. We want to be leaders in this sector. We have re-engaged 75 scientists in our research centers. We move forward to facilitate the trade corridors because we know how it is important for our producers and processors, exporters, to get their goods to market. And we also invested, and we have a plan to fully connect the rural, uh, the rural region and to provide broadband. We have also undertaken a regulation review, and we have started to change taxes, um, taxes methods, like the accelerated investment incentive to encourage producers. So we have already made a lot of changes and we have already made agriculture a priority and we want to continue and move forward. Thank you. And Monsieur Berthold, s'il plaît, your response. Monsieur Berthold, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it's high, times, high time for real changes at the head of government, uh, such that agriculture is at one of the top priorities uh, of the federal government's cabinet. You know, it's all well and good to put in place a, a whole uh, suite of measures, but after uh, years of meeting, we can see that farmers across Canada, in Quebec, in other provinces, across the board, uh, are barely able to make ends meet. Uh, and, uh, and that problem won't be resolved uh, as long as we aren't in a position to tell the Prime Minister's cabinet that agriculture needs to be at the heart of their uh, actions. There are two visions pitted against each other. The Liberals, agriculture isn't a priority. The Conservatives want to make agriculture at the top priority in the decision-making process. Over the past four years, there have been no new bills introduced by the Liberal government to improve the plight of farmers and processors in Canada, and that's not surprising. Yes, there have been a number of changes, but all of those changes have led to Un uh, unexpected uh, damage, uh, for example, uh, tax fraud in the dairy sector, uh, fiascos at uh, an international level, and what's happened with Italy and uh, India, uh, beef, fruit in uh, Europe, and of course China, and the food guide. did nothing to try to fix this problem, and we are now in this situation that we are not selling soya, canola, beef and pork to China. So this is a huge problem. By putting a agriculture in first, by putting agriculture in the art of our cabinet decision, we will change it and we will succeed to help farmer and to promote the agriculture here and abroad. Thank you, Monsieur Bertold. 
Uh, we are now going to enter two minutes of open debate. So, uh, would anyone like to begin? Mr. Berthold, I'd like you to tell me how you believe producers will believe you when you say that agriculture will be the Conservatives' top priority when, when the Conservatives are in power. You are cut uh, uh, over $700,000 from services uh, to uh, farmers or billion dollars, rather. Madame uh, Bibo, uh, could you tell me why the Liberals have done nothing and sat on their hands in the face of the most serious crisis in the Canadian agricultural history? Uh, it, that is the crisis uh, with the canola in China. They waited for someone to take a call. They waited for someone to blame. They waited while producers suffered. They waited for election being called. This is not putting farmers in top priority. This is waiting for something to happen. But unfortunately, nothing happened. And who suffered? Doug Miller. Doug Miller, who I was there. I met with Doug Miller last week uh, in Alberta, Holds in Alberta. He was uh, swatting his canola field. It was 9.30 p.m. And he said, I don't have any buyers for this crop. This is the huge problem. This is the problem that you must address, Minister. Well, no. Mary Claude, how can you ex uh, increase exports when the world doesn't want to buy high-priced Canadian exports now I and mean, we're trying to sell canola and we have too much in the bins we can't sell it all you try how can you increase to 75 billion when the world won't take what we have the world is looking for canadian products we are recognized for our our very high quality products and our very robust inspection system and the world won't and the world need our high quality programs and we are working with the producers with the processors to export to diversify and we are supporting them in different ways Con to the contrary the conservative have just cut over and over and over again in our programs like agri-stability for example that they've cut significantly. Our government has decided to form a, a new um, member of cabinet thank, de thank dedicated to, interna to uh, rural you. economic development. Thank you, thank you Madame Bibo. Um, I think we are going to have a great debate ahead of us. Uh, moving on to our second question, uh, the open debate actually transitions quite nicely into it. It's about risk management. Uh, disease outbreaks, trade actions and climate change are constant threats to the growth of Canada's agriculture sector. Farmers say Canada's current suite of risk management programs do not adequately respond to these challenges. What will your party do to ensure farmers have access to risk management programs that address producers' concerns? Uh, Ms. Story, we'll start with you. Two minutes. Okay, my son wants to come home and farm, but there's not enough profit in farming. The land prices are too high, the input costs are too high, and the returns are too low. And the business risk programs don't help. They're expensive band-aids that ignore the structural problems in agriculture today. Government has encouraged farms to specialize in one commodity, but we all know, anybody who farms know, that commodity prices boom and bust every three to 10 years. There's regular cycles. And that means that those big specialized farms that agriculture depends on are in danger of going bankrupt every cycle. That's why we have the business risk program, programs, because the barns have to be propped up. And now taxpayers are paying to prop up industrial hog barns that the taxpayer doesn't like. That's not a good idea. Meanwhile, mixed farms and smaller farms don't have that structural weakness, and they don't get much support. Farmers do need disaster relief programs, but agri-stability it costs a lot, and it does nothing for a well-run farm. The big challenge facing farmers is our own uh, government's decades-old policy to move people off the farm and encourage that high-risk, high-input, specialized production. So the Greens will turn that around. We'll focus on getting people back into farming, smaller, more diverse farms, lower input costs, help farmers learn techniques that can produce without emissions and without as much cost. And we'll try to get that support going, the support systems going to medium and smaller farms so we can get people back into rural Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Story. Uh, Madame Bibo, two minutes. We understand that farmers are going through a lot of challenges. 
the climate is changing, plant and animal disease, price volatility, market access, consumer preferences. The challenges are huge, but we are there working with them to support them and to help them be more resilient to these new challenges and to provide the right toolkit of risk management uh, programs. When the, agri, uh, the conservatives have decided to cut agri-stability coverage from 85% to 70%, we have allowed the provinces to deploy late participation to agri-stability when it was needed. We have improved the advanced payment program for the canola crisis. And we also uh, improve the, and ensure a quick response and effective uh, financial response to different um, issues like the bovine tuberculosis in Alberta, for example. We hear you. We understand that the business risk management tools are not adequate to the new challenges. This is why last July, when I was with the provincial and territorial ministers, we have decided to put these programs on a fast track and to make sure that we will improve it sooner and that we will be looking at agri-stability to start with to have a better formula for the coming growing season. Thank you, Madame Bibo. Uh, Monsieur Bertold, two minutes, please. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, there's an increasing number of players on the world stage uh, that are threats uh, to Canadian agriculture and exports. Uh, an increasing number of uh, countries are interfering in the uh, daily management of their farms. The Americans, to the tune of billions of dollars, have subsidised their farmers and uh, producers across the board. And that is a key factor. There's also climate change, uh, which is having an increasing effect. Uh, there are increasingly long drought periods, increasingly long humid periods. There are folks that have trouble getting their crops harvested because the snow comes too early, as does the ice. There is an increasing number of activists that are entering farms. We saw this recently. Uh, in uh, Western Canada, in uh, uh, a Houghtonite uh, uh, area. And there's been a number of threats that have come uh, even from the Liberal government with the carbon tax, which has uh, once and for all changed the way they make ends meet at the end of the month. As I said, there's an increasing number of threats, and the new Conservative government recognises this agricultural partner and the province as quickly as possible to study the best way to manage the risk of this new reality. Business risk management is an insurance. You are a part of this insurance. We, you have to be part of the solution and we will talk about the solution with you. But first, the government should help not get in the way. So I think this is the way we will address it and we will do it with you. Thank you, Mr. Bertold. Uh, Mr. McGregor, please. Thank you for the question. You know, when you look at the challenges facing farmers, uh, there are almost too many to count. Whether it's woes with our transportation system, whether it's the effects of climate change, not knowing what kind of weather is going to hit you from year to year. It might be a drought one year, a flood the other. Uh, storms that can flatten your crop in a matter of minutes. Also, the fluctuation of commodity prices, the instability of our international trade, because we can't really rely on a rules-based system anymore when, for example, when China decides to close off 40% of our canola seed market with the stroke of a pen and still has yet to produce any tangible evidence that there was any fault with our product to begin with. So when you look at all of these challenges, it's very integral that we have a dynamic business risk management program suite that is adaptable to changing situations. I think that I, I would absolutely support a review of the entire business risk management program suite to ensure that they are prepared for the worst case scenarios in each of those different challenges I outlined earlier. I think you also can't have one size fits all for, for various producers. Uh, a, a, a 
pork producer is going to have different needs from someone who grows canola, from someone who grows wheat, and so on. They have different challenges, different markets, and so we have to have a process that's adaptable to the emerging changes in the market and the realities on the ground. So keeping that open dialogue with farmers, farmers are the experts. They will tell you exactly what they need. They will tell you exactly how the programs can be modified, and I think any future government has to keep its ear open and make sure that those are respected. Now, Minister Bebo mentioned that the current programs are not adequate. Well, we, we have had four years of a majority liberal government, and you'd think that some preparation would have gone into this. Um, we're now at four years. I, I think better is always possible, as the liberals like to say, and that's what we need to concentrate on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Uh, moving to two minutes of open debate. Okay, Luke, uh, your government, the Conservative government, created agri-stability in that suite of programs. And you took away what we had before. You took away the disaster um, relief programs. Agri-stability doesn't work. It takes 18 months to get a payout after you've had a loss. And farmers can't wait. We have input costs, we have bills, we can't wait for 18 months. Um, and the Liberals haven't done anything either. You've both had years to fix this. And we farmers have been telling you to get those programs fixed so you deliver the aid where it's needed. The Canada Agriculture Partnership was renewed two years ago and extended for a new period. The programs were overhauled and enhanced to some extent, but indeed there is a whole slew of risks and issues, whether related to trade or climate, that our farmers and producers have to come to grips with. And as far as international trade is concerned, the trade rules are, well, are they not necessarily changing? We want them to remain in place, and that's why Canada has a strong voice to uh, maintain them, and they must be science-based and evidence-based. Canada, therefore, has a strong voice to uh, have a, a rules-based system uh, adhered to, and that's why we're the, uh, a reliable partner, we're the envy of the world, and moreover, uh, this uh, reality of climate change has really hit our producers hard and that is why we have uh, one-off uh, uh, disaster relief measures and we've also undertaken with the ministers of provinces and territories to overhaul this suite of programs. Four years. I think one of the other challenges, too, is, is, is expanding from the business risk management program. Uh, we know that the average age of farmers is, is getting quite high. So when we're looking at new entrants trying to get young farmers in the business, they want to see that these BRMs are there for them. But we also want to make it easier for them to get in, to, to start up a farming business, make it viable, Sorry. but also to make sure that the, the family farm can be Sorry. handed down to them. Sorry, Mr. Yeah. McGregor, that's time. Um, <laughs> Next, next question, uh, we're going to start with Madame Bibeau. Uh, question number three. The 2017 Barton Report identified several sectors, including pulse and oil seeds, aquaculture, and agri-food technology, as industries that have immense export potential. How would your party drive and support these emerging sectors so they can reach their full potential? We're going to start with you, Madame Bibeau. Two minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. We, it's very important to diversify our markets domestically and internationally. So diversification and opening new markets for emerging sectors is not limited to export, but it has to be done domestically as well. So I think about uh, diversifying our products, adding value, um, adapting to new consumers' demand. And uh, for that, for example, we have launched our new and the first uh, Canada food policy and there's a component to buy for buy Canadian promotion campaign into it because we want to put you know we, we want to encourage Canadians to learn more about understand better the Canadian agriculture and support it uh, we are thinking as well as a in terms of value added processing the importance of creating um, an ecosystem to support the industry to add value to our products and not only export raw material. This is important. We have launched a strategic innovation program with $100 million. We have invested in a protein industry super cluster, cl cluster uh, for which we believe uh, it will uh, create $4.5 billion to our economy. And uh, biofuels is another uh, exp uh, sector uh, that is very promising. And the way we look at it, in a holistic 
uh, we have a holistic you know, view around uh, diminishing uh, our emissions and it's uh, working on the clean fuel standard but working on it with the, the industry making sure that it will bring the best results to our agricultural uh, sector. Organic is also an interesting uh, market uh, emerging that it's a, we want to support. Thank you, Madame Bibo. Uh, Mr. Bertold, you have two minutes. Merci beaucoup. Je pense que la clé... Thank you very much. I think that the key to the success of emerging sectors in Canada to ensure that our products uh, continue to enjoy growth and uh, enjoy their full potential, that is to adequately support uh, uh, farmers. The current government has uh, closed off, closed us off to agricultural markets abroad and uh, the minister needs to be there, at the, seated at the table when it comes to international trade, finance, uh, uh, global affairs. The uh, Canada's agriculture uh, minister, and Canada is one of the countries recognised on the world stage for the quality of its food, the minister of agriculture always needs to be seated at the table when necessary. And unfortunately, as we've observed over recent years, this is no longer the case. You've seen what happened in uh, India and also wheat. Uh, sold to Italians for pasta. The market was completely closed off and the Canadian government has done absolutely nothing to reopen the market. There have been a number of uh, oils, uh, pulses sent and we've been very proud of this. Uh, uh, we even sent our PM to India and it didn't improve anything. On the contrary, it uh, made it worse. And I also referred to what occurred in China. So first and foremost, if we want to uh, each of our crops to reach their targets uh, as stipulated in the Barton report, well, agriculture needs to be the government's top priority. We need to support first and foremost our farmers, but they can't sell their produce if there's no market in which to do so. And the onus is on the government to open this up, whereas it's doing the opposite. They're closing these markets and we won't reach our full potential wherever there are consumers, clients, whether that be in or the organic range, beef, uh, pork. There are clients, there are customers. Canada must be there to meet their needs. And to do that, we need to support our farmers. Uh, Mr. McGregor, you have two minutes. So last year, our committee, the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food, did a cross-Canada trip as a part of our technology and innovation study. And we did four stops. And the theme, of course, was looking at all of the amazing innovation and technological leaps and bounds that's going on in many different centers around this great country. I was really struck by our stop in Saskatoon where there's a, a food development center where they are you know, making some interesting food products uh, out of uh, peas and lentils, you know, protein bars. And so I think that's a really amazing opportunity because you're taking a very nutritious food group, which many people would look at in its raw form and maybe not be that interested in consuming. But they're now taking that, adding value to it, and packaging it in, in protein bars, in, in uh, sometimes a, a yogurt, and so on. So I think that kind of innovation is really exciting. With respect to aquaculture, you know, I, I, I come from a riding that's on the west coast, and our salmon farms, especially the open net ones in wild salmon migration routes, has certainly been a lot of controversy. That's why my party was the one that brought forward a private member's bill that would have helped the industry transition from open net fish farms on wild salmon migration routes to land-based closed containment systems because there's a consumer demand out there which is uh, looking at how sustainably our food products are produced. And I think that people want to see that we are living up to the highest standards. So yes, there is potential in aquaculture, but it has to be done on a closed containment basis, away from any harm to wild salmon migration routes. So that would be my main stipulation for that. But you know, there, there's a lot of Canadian know-how. Uh, farmers are really pushing the envelope, so are our researchers in universities. We just need the government to be ready that, to extend that helping hand at the opportune moment. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. And Ms. Story, please, two minutes. So, Alistair, I really agree with you on getting the uh, aqu aquaculture out of the seas and into closed containers on land. Um, we have to do that. We can't continue to infect our wild salmon populations with the diseases in those open nets. 
Um, the Green Party is particularly interested in the emerging markets for high quality food, uh, value added, organic food, and food branded made in Canada. Um, we, we want to replace a third of the food that we import with made in Canada products. Uh, Canada imports food worth $45 billion. That, uh, if we replace a third, that would add $15 billion a year to agriculture. Greens will uh, create a Buy Canada program, improve food labels and food testing so people can, who choose Canadian food will know what they're getting. We will also review the maximum limits for pesticide residues and bring Canadian standards up to that of the other OEC, OECD countries. I disagree with what everyone said about Canada having the highest quality food, at least when, we come, when it comes to chemical residues. For example, the Canadian limit on permethrin, which is used on lettuce, is now 400 times weaker than in Europe. Greens would increase the testing. We would raise the limits up to the world. Um, average of, the, of our trading partners are our, our trading partners who trade in quality food, not the ones that want, like China, the bottom of the barrel. Canada can compete on quality. We shouldn't be, uh, you know, throwing that quality away. Organics, in particular, is now worth five billion dollars in Canada and has vast potential for growth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Story. And we're now going to go to two minutes of open debate and feel free to just jump in. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add on, on the organic sector. You know, we've seen the statistics, uh, as was mentioned, it, it's worth uh, that considerable sum of money, but also the potential growth rate that's going on. And for, for a population that's looking at the inputs that are put on crops, uh, looking at, at uh, you know, pesticide residues and, and how it's farmed, how much fertilizer was used. If you look at centers like the UBC Research Farm, some of the amazing uh, research they're doing on pest management and growth techniques, all organic, I think that's a sector that deserves far more federal investment than what it's currently receiving, which would be commensurate with the importance it is now playing in the Canadian economy, but also its future potential. I have a question for the Minister to reach its full potential so that products can be developed, so that we can develop new products. We have to deal with the CFIA's uh, regulatory approval process and overcome the difficulties of that. We know that uh, some products can be approved at a provincial level, others at a federal level. So for those uh, developing new products, it's becoming increasingly fraught with difficulty. Even as far as uh, organics uh, are concerned, we would have expected the government to uh, support uh, this uh, organic certification. So what's the government done in over the past four years to cut through paperwork so that we can uh, produce and get access to new products because we haven't seen anything done to date. And so well, we've it, it reinvested in the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, whereas the Conservatives, uh, in fact, uh, uh, made cutbacks to their budget. And that uh, speaks to their lack of confidence and faith in science and, and nor in the CFIA. They cut their funding and they expect us to be even more effective and efficient. We, the Liberals, have uh, reinvested, we have uh, ad uh, adapted regulations to favour exports. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're moving on to question four. Uh, this question will be in French, so if you need uh, to make sure that your translators are working, uh, go ahead. Supply management was put in place by the federal government to provide market stability for dairy, egg and poultry farmers in Canada. Farmers state that the system has been successful for decades, but now feel that the integrity of the system is being eroded by successive trade agreements which saw concessions that increased access to domestic markets to foreign competition. The government recognised that the negative impacts of CETA, the European Agreement and the CPTPP in a recent announcement for the dairy industry, but has not done the same for the poultry and and eggs sectors. 
What will your party do to ensure that all supply managed producers are provided measures to mitigate the loss of their markets? And what will your party do to ensure no further concessions on supply management in future trade agreements? Well, thank you very much. First and foremost, uh, our party and Andrew Scheer has undertaken to provide no future concessions in future trade agreements. Second, we were delighted that the Liberal Party finally adopt the compensation plan that we laid out in 2015 for dairy producers. However, they forgot two crucial sectors, and that is poultry and eggs. Why was nothing announced for them? Dairy producers were completely left out of this compensation uh, plan, and, uh, or processes rather, and on the uh, minister's website, well, there was uh, the announcement for dairy producers, and then it was deleted the next day, and that left us uh, completely puzzled. Just before the election, we heard of uh, envelopes of money for uh, dairy producers just for one year, but uh, nothing further. And the uh, seven years thereafter were not calculated. As producers and farmers, we need predictability. What's going to happen that year, the next year, three years down the track, seven years? Will there be a succession plan? And with no predictability, we won't be able to guarantee our crops. Why weren't the Liberals able to provide that commitment, a government under Andrew Scheer will adhere to the full compensation program laid out by the Conservatives in 2015, and there will be fair compensation for dairy producers, but also for egg and poultry producers. And we negotiate. We won't do so behind closed doors, subject to confidentiality agreements so that we can't discuss what's happening. We're going to discuss this in an open forum because these associations are entitled to know where they're at. Supply management, this is a crucial issue. We need to ensure that these sectors are supported. Mr McGregor, two minutes, please. So the NDP remains fully committed to protecting supply management. And, you know, with all due respect to both my Liberal and Conservative colleagues, uh, we have to take a little walk back down history lane. It was the Conservative government, the previous Conservative government, that started the negotiations on CETA and TPP. The Liberals concluded them and then, of course, went forward with the Canada-United States-Mexico agreement. Both of these parties have made promises to the supply managed sector that no concessions will make, be made, that we will always be there to protect you. And yet, time and time again, we keep on seeing percentages of our market slowly uh, eroded away and then promises of compensation. Should there be compensation? Absolutely. But it would be absolutely preferable if we didn't need to do that in the first place. Supply management has been a bedrock for so many communities across this great land. Whether it comes to poultry, dairy, turkeys or eggs, these farms have benefited from a system that gives them the stability to understand what the future will hold. By import control, production control and price control, farmers are able to look ahead in the future and make the necessary adjustments and improvements to their farm because they have a reasonable expectation of what their income will be. What they need is they need a federal government who will actually stand by its words and follow up with the appropriate action. You know, we have now seen in the single mandate of the Liberals where 8.4% of our dairy production was traded away. And of course, our egg and poultry sectors have suffered as a result. I think it's high time that our supply managed farmers stop paying the price for the overproduction problems of other jurisdictions. You know, we have one state in the United States that produces more milk than the entire country of Canada combined. And it's not up to the federal government to make concessions for those foreign jurisdictions. It's up to the federal government to stand for our farmers here and now and to say no means no, no further concessions, and back those words up with action. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Ms. Story, you have two minutes. There is no reason for American milk to be coming into Canada because Canada has bought, banned RBST, which is the growth hormone that they use in the states to create more milk. Um, it's banned in Canada. Why are we importing milk that contains a banned substance? The Green Party will protect supply management, but we are not happy about the con consolidation and corporate takeover and the lobbying power. For example, let's talk about raw milk. 
The dairy lobby, standing up for farmers, asked to weaken the cleanliness standards of milk. Milk is tested with a somatic cell count. It, uh, um, and the, the old uh, limit was 100,000, and they raised it to 400,000. It makes life easier for, for uh, farmers. However, milk today in Canada can't safely be relied on to be safe to drink raw. But people want raw milk. What, in the Green Party, when there are two opposing viewpoints, the Greens keep talking to both sides until a solution can be found. Raw milk is sold safely in England. It would be a simple matter of taking or recognizing raw milk and things like pastured poultry as unique products and then taking them out of the supply management so, and then uh, in, imposing a higher cleanliness standard so that raw milk, hygienic raw milk, could be sold in Canada. If supply management is going to survive, the, the lobbies have to start working with Canadians and making it work for Canadians. Greens will keep talking until we find mutually acceptable solutions. Thank you, Ms. Story. Et Madame Bubot, vous avez deux minutes. Madam Bibo, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, the Conservatives are not at all credible when they speak about supply management. And that's akin to standing up for women's rights in their case. You have to look at what all the majority of their members believe, and uh, they are very much divided. Most of them voted for Maxime Bernier, and he is a staunchest advocate uh, for dismantling the supply management system. So that speaks for itself. At the last uh, uh, convention, a resolution was adopted to dismantle the supply management system at the Conservatives' convention. We have undertaken to maintain the supply management system in the face of the US administration's uh, uh, ardent efforts to dismantle it. Uh, and this is discussed each and every day in the House of Commons, and the Conservatives are demanding that this new agreement be signed, and we haven't done so. Of course, we would have all preferred to not have to uh, forego uh, a certain percentage of our market share. This is important for our supply managed producers. And we need to work alongside folks on the ground. We formed a working group to properly assess the impacts uh, and so that our response is in tune with the impacts on our various sectors. So in mid-August, we were able to announce that dairy producers receive uh, half a billion dollars over eight years, or, or two billion dollars. There was also investment programs uh, to the tune of billions of dollars and $1.75 billion over the upcoming years. So 30 $345 million prorated from the 31st of August to 11 Canadian, 11,000 Canadian producers. The Canadian Dairy Corporation will be able to divvy up these funds. And our commitment to producers and to processors of poultry and eggs across all sectors is as strong as it has always been. And we will work together to ensure it happens. Minister, two minutes open debate. Do you believe that the agreement with the United States is a good agreement for Canadian producers? Response, well, it's a good agreement for overall for Canadian producers, but what about supply management producers, uh, says Mr Bertold? Well, yes, of course it has had an impact. Question, why are you allowing the Americans to determine and impose upon us our uh, classification system and our ability to export uh, uh, powder in a milk, uh, milk in a powder form. <laughs> Mr. Beltold, you, you wanted us to sign this agreement with the United States. We have a supply management system. Mr. Beltold, we have we never at our previous convention adopted that measure. Well, there was a resolution put forward, says uh, 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 Madame uh, uh, Gibault, but Andrew Shefford has uh, uh, considers that it's an excellent agreement that we signed with the United States, whereas we, in fact, have renounced our sovereignty to the United States. Mr. 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 We'll, let, we'll let the minister respond so we yeah. can hear her, um, Madame Bibo. <laughs> The interpreter would point out that uh, they were speaking over each other. This is an agreement that is good for the Canadian economy, 
overall and for the agricultural sector overall. But it is true that supply management sectors, there will be ramifications for them and that's why we're working hand in hand with them to assess these impacts and to develop better compensation systems for poultry, eggs and dairy, for producers and uh, trans... Supply management was supposed to work for family farms. It was supposed to keep dairy and poultry in the hands of family farmers. And it doesn't. Um, there's a, a, an Ontario corporate company that's buying up Manitoba egg farms. I mean, an egg farmer, like real farmers, family farmers, can't compete. You have to take the price of the quota down. Off would be better. And, and, and that's, that's our time, unfortunately. Merci beaucoup. Uh, all right. So Thank you very much. We finished our first four questions, which means, debaters, it's now time for our rapid fire round. Um, before, we get, we be, before we begin, here's a quick recap of the rules. The rapid fire round will require a yes or no answer. After all participants have answered, you will each be given 30 seconds to either expand on your answer or to respond to one of your fellow participants' answers. Everybody understand? Clear as mud? Okay, see no signs of obvious confusion. Uh, let's begin. Uh, I'm going to start with Mr. McGregor and we're just going to work our way down as, as we've done. Okay, so our first question. Uh, do you support the use of GMOs, Mr. McGregor? No. Ms. Story? Absolutely not. No. Madame Bibo. You know politicians can't answer by yes or no. It's a yes or no <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. Monsieur Berton. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. McGregor, you have 30 seconds. So I do not support the use of foreign genetic material being put into a crop. I think what we have to be concentrating on is probably the new emerging technology of gene editing, where you're not, in fact, introducing foreign genetic material. This may be necessary to make our crops much more resilient in the face of the challenges of climate change, but certainly not GMOs. I think that argument has been put to bed many years ago. Ms. Story? Gene editing is worse. <laughs> um, the problem with, the big problem for farmers with GMOs is that it allows the patenting of that uh, seed or, or animal. And that means that some corp transnational corporation owns that and can charge you a, a big price. Canola seed used to be, you know, $100 a bag. Now it's $800 a bag for a bag of seed. It doesn't cost that much to produce it. They're gouging us. Thank Re GMOs allowed Thank the you. farmers to be Thank gouged. Thank you, Ms. Story, Madame Bibo, 30 seconds. I will not pretend I'm a scientist, <coughs> I'm not. And I think this is a good example of a decision that has to be taking, you know, listening to scientists, uh, watching uh, science and investing in science. I think GMOs and they are a different declination. There's uh, a different to GMOs, of course, a broad variety. And this is why we need to leave this issue up to scientists and make a dis uh, science based decisions. Mr. Berthold, 30 seconds. GMOs indeed uh, help us to feed the global uh, population. Are we doing it properly cur currently? I don't think so. And those uh, folks who have been working in this uh, sector over uh, the years, they've been presenting research and uh, science. Well, they haven't done enough either. So this isn't an easy question to answer with a yes or no. But I do believe that science will help us to feed our global population, which will be be, get bigger and bigger Thank over you, upcoming uh, years and it will whilst protecting question. the environment. Do you think activists have the right to enter Canadian farms without permission? Ms. Story, we'll start with you. No, no one has a right to enter someone's oh, sorry, farm. It's just a yes or no question. Oh, so sorry. no, no. Madame Bibo? No. Monsieur Bertold? Absolutely not. Monsieur McGregor? No. Okay, now, Ms. Story, you have 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Nobody has a right to trespass. And I don't know why activists are labeled as any worse than anybody else. I mean, Sure, protesting is legal in Canada. People are allowed to express their views, but no one is allowed to damage property or trespass. I agree with my colleague from the Green Party entirely. It's completely unacceptable that activists uh, 
a trespass on private property. First, it's illegal. Second, uh, we need to respect the work of our farmers who's, uh, working, who are working tirelessly. We also have to adhere to biosecurity rules. Mr Berthold, I have a message for folks that want us to eat differently. You know, walk the talk. You don't need to trespass on private property. Many people agree with the way that you want to promote your lifestyles, but you shouldn't do so in uh, interfering with uh, the choices of others, and that has caused undue stress to producers. It's egregious and unacceptable. I understand that uh, some people might have intentions, but they don't understand the harm they're causing when they go onto a farming property unannounced without permission. There are complex biosecurity requirements, and they have to understand that farmers often live where they work, and so invading their personal space causes a lot of stress, and in fact, it's probably causing a lot more to the harm to the animals that these protesters are purporting to protect. Thank you. Our third rapid-fire question. Do you support the current government's regulatory plan to implement front-of-package labeling? Uh, Madame Bibot, we'll start with you. Yes. Monsieur Bertold? No. Monsieur McGregor? Yes. Madame Story? Yes. All right, Madame Bibot, you have 30 seconds. Alors, uh, l'étiquetage. Uh, well, front-of-label packaging, a front-of-package labeling is important. It's a matter of health. Uh, for Canadians' health, we need to identify products that are higher in sugar, in salt. Canadian consumers want us want to be able to make well-informed decisions before eating products. Well, that's exactly what I say when the Minister of Agriculture needs to be serving farmers and not just her cabinet colleagues. She has just clearly described how you can stand up for an unacceptable uh, status quo by proposing something that's unacceptable. Well, we'll put a big, smack a big label on the package, but that's unacceptable because we need to put farmers at the heart of our decision-making process. And here's the problem with the whole process that the Liberals went through. I am always going to be in favour of giving consumers more information about the products they ingest and use on an everyday basis. But it's very important that any government that's going to be doing this must have the consultation with the farmers who are producing the food in the first place. And that was sadly lacking. That's what I heard from farm groups time and time and time again. They weren't necessarily opposed to the idea. They just were very unhappy with how the process rolled out. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. And Ms. Story, 30 seconds. What are farmers worried about? You put a label GMO on, on a, a food label. And if you think it's OK, why are you afraid to label your food properly, honestly, transparently. The, the consumer should have the right to know what they're eating. They're putting this in their bodies. If, if somebody doesn't want GMO or whatever, well, then that should be their choice. Farmers shouldn't, and the agribusiness industry shouldn't make choices for Canadians. Uh, thank you. Uh, to be clear, the question was about front of package labeling, not GMO labeling. But we put the GMO <laughs> on the labels. Uh, our last rapid-fire question, we'll start with Monsieur Bertold. Uh, the question is as follows. Do you support the Canada Food Guide as currently written? Monsieur no. Bertold? Sorry, go ahead. No. Uh, Mr. McGregor? Yes. Madame Story? Yes. Madame Bibot? Yes. Monsieur Bertold, you have 30 seconds. So this is a good food guide. This is a food guide who is uh, good for the health of the people, but there's not enough information. We've asked for the Canada Food Guide at the Standing Committee on Agriculture to be studied at length for all stakeholders to be able to give their input. Unfortunately, the Liberal government refused uh, them that opportunity. There's been uh, a uh, dearth, a lack of a consultative process. I'm sure that at the end of the day, the Canada Food Guide will turn out good, but everyone should have had the right to give input. I think what's, what I really like about the, the visual presentation of the new Food Guide is that under each category of food, it gives consumers a lot of different choices. So it's not excluding traditional protein sources like meat and eggs. Those are included there, but it's also expanding the range of possibilities. And I think that the food guide has to be uh, fair to all producers, who, no matter what type of food they're producing. So I think it's good to have that visual image. And uh, yes, I do support it for that reason. Madame Story, 30 seconds. Yes, I, I, I like that plate with the different 
sections. It's very much easier to use, and I like the diversity of foods. Um, but the New Canada policy says nothing about moving away from greenhouse gas emissions or pesticides or livestock crowding or algae blooms. Food policy sounds good, but there's no concrete actions. It's all talk, no outcomes. Thank you, and Madame Bibo, 30 seconds. We launched the Canada Food Guide and the Food Policy. The Food Guide seeks to encourage Canadians to adopt better lifestyle habits, healthy eating habits. And then you have the Food Policy, the purpose of which is to extend access for all Canadians to healthy and nutritious food. This policy has a number of prongs, supporting infrastructure, local food, reduced waste, and so on and so forth. All right, we've uh, made it through the first half of the debate, so we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with more questions. All right. Hello, my name is Michael Graydon, and I'm the CEO of Food and Consumer Products of Canada. We are honoured to be the exclusive sponsor of tonight's Canadian Federation of Agriculture's Leaders Debate. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the candidates and their respective parties for participating in this debate on the critical issues and opportunities facing Canadian agriculture, agri-food and manufacturing. With the federal election coming very soon, it is more important than ever that our political officials represent our sectors in a true and meaningful way. For those that are not aware of FCPC, we are the voice of Canada's food and consumer products industry on a variety of issues impacting Canadians. These include food and product safety, helping to bring innovative products to market, including healthier for you options, promoting environmental stewardship, product labeling, and working to ensure the competitiveness of our industry so that Canadians have choice and access to world-leading safe and innovative products. With that said, we hope all of our industry stakeholders, political officials, and members of the public find value from this evening's debate. I'm sure it will illustrate the positive impact of our sector to Canadians and to our economy as a whole. From everyone at Food and Consumer Products of Canada, I thank the CFA for the opportunity to sponsor this debate, and I thank all the candidates for their participation. I hope everyone enjoys the second half of this exciting debate. Welcome back, everyone, and if you're just joining, hello. Uh, we will now begin the second round of questions. Debaters, our first question is about China. China, as you all know, represents an important market for Canadian farmers, but is at the center of an ongoing trade dispute between Canada and China. What immediate actions would your party take to address and remedy China's decision to block some Canadian agricultural exports? Monsieur Bertold, we'll start with you. You have two minutes. Merci beaucoup. 
plusieurs actions. Thank you very much. Many actions could have been taken uh, since uh, for quite some time in this China issue. We know that this is a highly politicized issue. Unfortunately, since January, the government of Canada has done nothing. There's just inertia. At the outset, they refused to acknowledge it was a political crisis. And uh, we should have sent a delegation to determine whether the Chinese information was accurate and reliable. Then the upshot was that, was that there was uh, the absence of a, a shipping uh, a certificate and China jumped on this to block our exports of pork and meat. Unfortunately, this occurred in July, June, July, and to, to this very day, there's been no concrete solution being proposed. We've just been uh, sitting on our hands, and since uh, April, Mr. Shear will in fact uh, propose three options to the government. First, uh, appoint an ambassador, an ambassador for China. How can you address the problem if there's no ambassador? Then, uh, a complaint before the World uh, Trade Organization. Third, and unfortunately, just a couple of days before the writ was dropped, uh, uh, did the government decide what to do? Otherwise, they'd still be waiting. Third, how is it uh, that uh, the Asian uh, Infrastructure and Chinese Infrastructure Bank, uh, well, why do we still uh, support them? Why they refuse to uh, allow our shipments? So, so much could have been done to address this issue to uh, find a proper solution. All I can say is that uh, the previous Conservative government, well, a Conservative Minister of Agriculture would have jumped on a plane to go and remedy the issue. But unfortunately, our minister stayed in Canada. She waited. She sat on our hands. And during this time, producers such as Doug Miller, well, his the canola production, which he's harvesting now, well, he has no buyers. Why? Because Canada, Canada sits, rests on its laurels. And uh, unfortunately, international crises aren't uh, solved that way. Well, the Chinese crisis is highly complicated, and clearly Mr. Bertold doesn't appreciate the, the complexity of this issue. Right from the very outset, we stood behind our farmers. ...shoulder with our producers and exporters, and this is why we are working. We formed a working group. You will say again, but this is so important to take the right decisions. We have improved the advanced payment program as they asked it for. We have increased the capacity of our producers to uh, make some loans and up to $1 million, and also for canola producers, uh, they can have free interest-free loan up to $500,000. We have uh, extended the agri-stability program, so we have put some certain number of measures in place to support them. We have also uh, put forward or increased our efforts to diversify our market. This is very important, and working them with the Minister of uh, international diversification is very important. We have just uh, we have sent the um, the request to the WTO for consultation with China. We have recently named a very very good ambassador to China. This is not someone that you can choose overnight. You have to choose the right person who knows the country, who will be well respected, and a person who really is a very good advocate for the agricultural sector. Uh, we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with our producers. Pour les producteurs de porc et de bœuf, Pork and beef producers. Well, the issue is different for them. It's not just a matter, well, China didn't uh, indicate that they found something awry in our uh, products, whereas it comes to uh, meat, there was an issue with the export certificates, and our decisions are in keeping with uh, what the Chinese authorities have requested, and we hope that this blockage will be resolved as soon as possible and so that the Chinese market can be reopened. Greens will be sensible about China. Canada had a bumper canola crop last year. A bumper crop means the bins are full, and that always makes the price go down. Canada has actually sold about the same amount as canola on the world market as ever. Less went to China, but more went to other markets. And wheat sales to China are actually up. China is just grandstanding and playing politics. We can't let them push Canada around. If we are going to trade with a giant, we have to be prepared. 
The real concern for canola growers should be the business risk management programs and overproduction. So let's talk about Canada's real trade advantage. Our advantage is our reputation for high quality and our winter, which protects from disease. We used to get a premium for that quality in the global market until the Conservatives got rid of the Canadian Wheat Board. Canada can't compete on cheapness. We've never been able to compete on cheapness. And we can't try it and protect workers and protect the environment at the same time. So Greens will refocus agriculture onto that high quality. We'll improve animal welfare standards, get the hormones out of beef so we can actually sell beef to Europe, get the antibiotics out of pork and the pesticides out of grain so we can serve the domestic Canadian demands, and we'll support organic agriculture that's already focused on quality and fairness to farmers. We'll look at tariffs for inputs with a particularly high carbon intensity. So why in the world are we importing apples from South Africa when we can grow good Canadian apples? We have to make trade work for Canadians and farmers and not just focus on the grain and the meat exports and neglect everything else. Thank you, Ms. Story and Mr. McGregor. You have 30 seconds. Or sorry, two minutes. Well, I don't want to give anyone uh, a false sense of hope because if you look at the history of uh, Chinese tactics in this regard, when it's happened with other countries. Whenever China has perceived something, an, an action of another country as to being injurious to its national pride, they have reacted with retaliatory trade measures. It's happened in South Korea, it's happened in Japan, and now China has come after us because what's looming in the background, of course, is the situation with Huawei. And we, of course, can't forget that there are two Canadians that are currently sitting in a Chinese jail. So we, we have to send our thoughts and prayers to them because there's a real, there are real human lives at stake in this whole thing. The thing with uh, this is that China, to date, has still not produced any satisfactory evidence that there are phytosanitary concerns with our canola seed. And, you know, I remember pressing Minister Carr and Minister Bebo on this issue back in the spring when they appeared before our committee. The thing that we <coughs> have to start looking at is what other measures can we be bring to bear to try and resolve this issue, to show China that we're not going to just simply roll over and take it. And I think one of the things that needs to be examined is the fact that we currently have a trade deficit with China. We are buying more Chinese imports than we are sending there, and it's, it's to the tune of over $40 billion. So I think at this stage, because so far none of the present tactics have worked, is we have to start letting the Chinese authorities know that there are consequences to continuing this dispute without bringing up the necessary evidence that something was wrong in the first place. And I think it points also to a larger problem that the countries of the world have to establish some kind of a standard that all will agree to whenever these phytosanitary concerns are brought to bear. Some standard that everyone can agree to, that everyone can have confidence in, but one that also has a measurable timeline so that our producers are not left in the situation that they are currently in. Thank you. We'll now go to two minutes of open debate. Uh, and so the Conservatives made the trade deal with China, and you've locked us in, so we don't have the options that we used to have. The trade deal? Yes, Which the FIPA. FIPA. Okay. <laughs> you know what? This is not a FIPA uh, uh, what we are talking about right now. We are talking okay, about the closure idea. of the China, Chinese ah. market for canola producers. But we have and, no... and you know what? They are struggling. They are losing money each and every month because yes, they are selling more wheat, but you know that the money they have received for is less than ever. That's so this is, the, this is the real problem. This is the real problem they are facing. The, the question I have, why is the government have waited so long to try to do something because it was the dawn of an election. Yes, Prime Minister decided to name an ambassador, but he did something to protect himself before the election, not to protect our producers. This is how they are working. And this is why we have not fixed this problem at all yet. Thanks. So, Thanks. the Minister, why are you here? We'll let Madame Bibo jump in. So, we have been working on the China issue from day one, and we've done so in partnership with uh, industry stakeholders, uh, producers, uh, 
and uh, processes. Obviously, there's a trade war between uh, the US and China, and we're caught in the middle of that. Our top priority, well, our second priority is to reopen the market, because our top priority is indeed to ensure that uh, our two Canadians are safe and that they'll be repatriated safely. Our second priority, as I said, or our third priority, is to continue to work hard to reopen the markets, to continue to put pressure on the CFIA. The minister has, of course, intervened at certain levels. Too, like the Canola Council of Canada also has plans to increase our crush capacity for oil production. And as a value-added product, I'd like to see a lot more investment in that as well. And, Mr. I cut you off, so I'll give you 30 seconds. You're good? Okay. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> um, all right, moving on to question six then. Uh, Canada is one of a few countries in the world that is capable of producing more food than it consumes. Considering today's shifting global trade environment, what would your party do to ensure Canadian farmers can still both maintain and grow their export markets? And uh, we'll start with Madame Bibo. You have two minutes. First, I want to say that we recognize that uh, farmers are very good stewards of their land. They lived on their land. They live on their land for generation. They want it safe and good and prosperous for their kids and grandkids as well. And they depend, as we all do, on clean air, soil, and water. The agricultural sectors and, and actors are leaders in adopting sustainable production practices like no-till, for example. And this is important to recognize their good work. And this is something that we, I want to do through the food policy as well. When we talk about Buy Canadian promotion campaign, it will not only be by a, a marketing campaign, but really recognizing the good work of our producers. Well, while uh, the Conservatives have cut funding of agriculture and ag environmental science, they have closed an experimental farm. From our part, we have reinvested. We have reopened the Frelishbrook Experimental Farm. We have invested $100 million in agricultural science with si 75 more new scientists. $27 million uh, dollars for agricultural greenhouse gases program, $25 million agricultural clean technology program, living labs, $80 million for CFI, plant health research facility, and much more. So we are seriously and concretely engaging, and we will continue on this path to support our producers. Thank you, Ms. Story. You have two minutes. So I know a lot of people don't want to admit that climate change is real. It's a scary thing, but it is real. We have to do something about it. And continuing to focus agriculture policy only on exports is not going to do anything about climate change. When a farmer bulldozes more trees so he can grow more and ship more, or leaves the soil bare or applies nitrogen fertilizer to increase his production, they're re releasing carbon into the atmosphere. We have to capture carbon, but we can't ignore emissions in our, on our farms and in export. So the Green Party will look at regenerative agriculture, which reduces emissions. It reduces the need for pesticide and fertilizer by up to two thirds. You know, the techniques like cover crops and green manures and all that. With the livestock, we're looking at a reduced national cattle herd that would reduce the amount of methane emissions and raise farm gate prices as well. We Greens will tie the farm supports to regenerative techniques so that exports don't start leading, don't continue to lead Canada around by the nose. We'll use the Green Infrastructure Fund to plant trees and, and the PFRA, Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Measures. Renew the Environmental Farm Plan Program to help farmers focus on reducing their emissions, capturing carbon, while running prosperous farms. We can't keep on putting all our eggs into the export basket. We have to start protecting our own food supply here and reducing our emissions on our farms. Our kids are depending on us. Right. Thank you, um, Mr. McGregor. Just before, I, I want to be clear that the question is about global trade and, and how your government would deal with the shifting trade environment. So, Mr. McGregor, you have two minutes. Yeah, I think it was under the theme of carbon sequestration. 
That's uh, what we had on our paper. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but the, yes, yeah. the question yeah, yeah. is about global <laughs> trade. So I can repeat the question sure, if you need I, it. I okay. See, yeah. Um, um, so do you need me to repeat? So, it so under that that overall theme, I think that um, you know we have to look at the the methods that farmers are using because the question is like how do we remain competitive? Now, I hear a lot from the the liberals and the conservatives the never ending argument over the carbon tax, and you know the conservatives argue that that makes our farmers less productive, and and liberals say well there's a way to recycle it back into the economy. You know, I do support a price on carbon. I think that in order for our farms to remain competitive, I think special attention has to be paid to the amazing work that they can do in fighting climate change through soil, through carbon sequestration in the soil. So I think, you know, as consumers around the world are, are really tuning into the issue of climate change, I think the countries that will stand out are the ones that have that amazing track record of using great farming techniques to produce the most sustainable type of food imaginable. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, if we want to really look at how we maintain competitiveness, one of the things to do is to reduce the input costs. So we can do that by helping farmers with research in organic methods to, to maybe get them off the amount of fertilizer that they actually need to purchase. And you know that causes a lot of greenhouse gas emissions as well. We can also look at you know, different ways to manage pests, different crop rotations. I mean, a lot of farmers are already doing this, but they just need the federal government to maybe put in place some programs that help them remain competitive, but also give them some encouragement to do that. So I think there's some great opportunities out there, but one thing is for sure that we cannot ignore the elephant in the room. And that is climate change. And I think the farmers that will succeed are the ones that will actually have the demonstrable track record of putting their farm as an actual tool to combat this. And I think overall that will make them more competitive in the years ahead. Thank you. And Monsieur Bertold, you have two minutes. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Well, I understand that the minister's answer was uh, uh, for another question. Of course, uh, it was just a mistake in the order of the question, so uh, it's understandable. But it perhaps explains why the government isn't as uh, present on the world stage as we'd expect to promote our products. To be able to sell abroad, you have to be increasingly competitive. There are an increasing number of players uh, in the global market that want to take the place that can Canada has traditionally held. There's an increasing number of countries that are trying to circumvent uh, uh, trade agreement rules and so on and so forth uh, to take Canada's place. We've seen this uh, with the India issue. There are a lot of non-tariff uh, uh, barriers that are being erected. And we have to maintain our competitive edge. We need to ensure that our crops remain competitive vis-a-vis -vis this aggregative approach. More competitive, as my new Democrat uh, colleague argued is not through a carbon tax. Uh, we're going to be competitive. Uh, uh, we're going to, in fact, uh, fall behind as laggards behind countries that do not have a carbon tax. Uh, they, you know, we have done a lot to uh, respect the environment. Uh, our producers have done this. Carbon capture and storage. We need to promote uh, greener approaches rather than uh, having our farmers uh, subjecting them to these draconian measures because they'll be less competitive and will sell less products, fewer products. There's also the whole approval process for new products. There's a lot of red tape in Canada, whereas elsewhere, new products and innovations that can take our place, well, they are, in fact, fast-tracked through the approval process in these uh, foreign countries. Canada needs to become a leader again, but that will only occur if it's a top priority around the cabinet table. Mr. McGregor. Yeah, and so I, I just want to use a local example. I, I know uh, one of my constituents started up a company called EIO Diagnostics, which uses an imaging system to detect uh, you know, uh, somatic cell counts in cows. And, and so by doing that, you know, you can look at multiple cows in a herd in, a, in a just a matter of hours rather than actually having to do a physical laboratory test of the milk. Now, his company would not have been possible in Canada if it hadn't been for a special little bridging loan that allowed him to get that seed money to expand and, and, and expand the idea to, to other investors. So that's a, an example of where the Canadian know-how and technological advances, I think, 
think, you know, when you look at the work that's going on in multiple research centers across the country, that's precisely the, the type of technology that's going to allow our farmers to really maintain that competitive edge in the marketplace. The programs that we put in place to help young entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs, uh, are bearing fruit, and uh, there's a tremendous uh, example. You can see how uh, the commitments we've made in terms of divert diversification, and the minister announced a $1.1 billion investment for diversification, and this means more uh, uh, international trade commissioners that will be there to help uh, our exporters, and also the CFIA, who's doing a work that is directly linked uh, with our ability to and our capacity to export and uh, to adhere to, uh, our producers to adhere to the rules. The problem we have, Minister, the problem we have, Minister, is, is this is highly po politicised, uh, and the world is uh, highly politicised, and increasingly so. I know that you didn't have uh, time because you uh, uh, got the order of the questions wrong, but uh, Minister, politicians in other countries are in fact hampering us. You didn't go to Italy, you didn't go to India or China to address these issues. Response, we are present everywhere on the world stage. Well, the current Minister of Agriculture has uh, been in uh, her post for six months and she's uh, coming up to speed, but I can tell you that the key is diversification and we are moving ahead successfully in this realm. Uh, moving on to our next question. Again, this question will be in French. Farmers today are employing technology and innovation to reduce their carbon footprint, to make their business more resilient. What would your party do to help Canadian agriculture further reduce its carbon footprint and become a larger carbon sink for the entire country in the future? Okay, so the Green Party wants to tie farm subsidies to regenerative agriculture so that farmers can save money on their input costs and reduce emissions and reduce their pesticide use, as the Canadian people want to do. Techniques like within this uh, are like cover, cover cropping, green manures, reduced tillage. These can all significantly increase the carbon matter. Um, No-till also works for some <coughs> farmers. However, it is dependent on glyphosate and that is creating weed resistant issues. That uh, it, it's not gonna last very, uh, no-till is, it can't continue in that way. With livestock, there are so many options for rotational grazing. Um, basically, you have to have more grass, more trees. We have to incentivize, incentivize farmers to not bulldoze um, every last bit of their land, and to actually plant um, trees, shelter belts, farm along the farm edge, field edges in the riparian zones, because trees, of course, capture carbon, and they also mitigate drought. And drought is one of the effects of climate change that we're seeing. Droughts and floods, we have to think ahead and, uh, and climate-proof our farms. And the government can be very key in, in working with farmers to help us for the future. There's so many things we, we, we can do to, to help our farms, but the government has to get busy and do it. it. The time is getting too late. Green Party wants to reduce emissions by 60% in the next 10 years. That's, that's not very long. We really have to get on this and stop fiddling around. Thank you, Ms. Story. And uh, Mr. McGregor, you now have two minutes. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it can't be stated enough about the potential that agriculture has in fighting climate change. The, you know, I've seen some studies that look at a hectare of well-managed soil with, with, you know, the most up-to-date practices. And that one hectare of soil is capable in a single year of storing tons and tons of carbon. So if we can replicate that, you know, agriculture has this huge potential to actually be one of our greatest assets in combating climate change, of taking that 
excess carbon from the atmosphere and putting it in the soil. So we need to have those uh, those encouragements to our farmers. A lot of them, you know, they're already doing this and, and we can learn a lot from our farmers. But I think the federal government has a role to play in encouraging these these different techniques. Now, Ms. Story earlier talked about, uh, you know, she made a comment about the plant breeding techniques. Now, I just want to qualify that because I think that, of course, with better research funding into organic farming methods, we can come up with those crop varieties. But if you look at the pace of climate change, we may in fact have to resort to some instances where gene editing is going to, for example, take the genome of, of a wheat plant, for example. If we can make that plant through gene editing more resilient to the ravages of climate change, but also maybe in fact make it grow a longer root base and put more carbon in the soil, that's where I think that conventional farming and organic farming have to meet each other in the middle to adequately address the scope of the problem before us. I'm really excited about the potential that exists for this. Many farmers are already doing it. And like I said, uh, Canada, I think, has the potential, not only with what it's currently doing, but in the future, to, be, to set a global standard in this regard, to really show other countries around the world what it truly means to practice sustainable farming that is actually being a net carbon si sink. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Monsieur Bertold, vous Merci avez deux minutes. Thank you very much. Well, listen, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, I've crisscrossed Canada meeting uh, farmers, and uh, there's one thing that uh, both uh, I and they can be proud of is the work that they've done over the years to do their share to fight climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. New production methods, new uh, farming methods, they've undertaken so many uh, uh, steps, taken so many steps over recent years that unfortunately haven't been recognised. We need to take stock of the situation. That This is point A and here is point Z where we want to arrive at. Uh, and there should be, of course, more uh, effective ways of uh, protecting uh, waterways. That'll have a, an effect on reducing greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. And Andrew Scheer has, uh, in fact, a ta a tabled his, our Conservative Party's a green plan to help the agricultural sector. How? Well, we're going to emphasise uh, green technology and focus on that. We want to be able to provide as much green technology for farmers to use as possible to improve their practices and their crops. And green technology will help us to combat climate change. No carbon tax uh, will help uh, producers emit uh, fewer carbon emissions. And as I said, there's tremendous potential for Canadian producers and farmers to reduce uh, their carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emission footprint. But what's tremendous about this is this technology will be able to be exported. Agricultural methods can be exported abroad and have a meaningful impact uh, across the globe to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bertold. Okay, uh, and... It's important to recognize the tremendous exceptional work done by our producers. They are great stewards of our environment. This is their land, their animals, that is their lifeblood, their life and their passion. And of course they would hope that it would be the case for their children and great grandchildren and great grandchildren. So we need to acknowledge this right off the bat. Next, this is crucial. They have a key play to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their farming methods, in the way they feed their animals. And that is why we have made huge investments in research, science and green technology programs. Let me give you a couple of examples. $100 million for the scientific sector focusing on agriculture, 75 new scientists in our research centres, $27 million earmarked for the green greenhouse gas emissions program tied to agriculture, $25 million for a clean technology program for agriculture and other programs to ensure that our researchers are out on the ground side by side with our producers so that they can verify uh, these uh, technological and research ad advancements uh, as we proceed. And, and that is why 
the Department of Agriculture a team of officials needs to work uh, closely with the Department of the Environment and Climate Change because clearly the agricultural sector has a key role to, meet, to play to meet our objectives. We have to deal with climate change now. It's here, now. We can't just keep on talking about what we're going to do in the future sometime and then uh, put money into research of cap capturing carbons while still emitting more and more and more every year. We have to do something now. And as for the carbon tax, farmers don't pay carbon tax on farm fuel. We don't pay it on pesticides. We don't pay it on, on our inputs. Um, that carbon tax is fight. It's, you guys go have that for carbon tax fight, but it has nothing to do with farm families. I do think the, the conservatives are con deceiving Canadians when you talk about the carbon tax endlessly and you forget to talk about the money that goes back to Canadians and farm families um, as a dividend so we can do, change our lifestyles. Uh, the, the money is equal going both ways. So, so what are the results? What are the results? Well, for, 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 for uh, tax reducing the, the emission, just tell me, what is the result? What are the results? The result is you With guys are talking emissions? about it and fighting about it, and you're putting it on the agenda, the public agenda, and people know about it. People know that they have to reduce their emissions because we're fighting about it. Mr. So McGregor? keep fighting about it. Go ahead. <laughs> it's that, just raising the public knowledge. I think what's really key is that the change is coming, whether we like it or not. And the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to be. You know, I, I keep on hearing about the short-term costs of addressing climate change, but that completely ignores what the huge costs will be if we don't do anything. And these will have severe economic impacts on our farms. I mean, how much, uh, how many of our tax dollars are we prepared to spend 10, 20 years from now to actually adapt to climate change when the smart investment is here now and I think that research that that investment has to be done with public dollars you know I really appreciated my green candidates uh, comment earlier that it's too far swung to the corporations that research has to stay in the public domain with publicly funded scientists and that's our time all right we have reached the last question of the evening uh, mr. McGregor we will start with you and question number eight is as follows Chronic labor shortages, both at the farm level and within food manufacturing, have been flagged in the Barton and RBC reports as an impediment to the growth of Canada's agriculture sector. What will your party do to ensure that these shortages are addressed? Mr. McGregor, you have two minutes. Thank you for the question. This absolutely is a topic that has come up repeatedly whenever I've met with a variety of farm groups. And the problem is, is that the system uh, over the last four years has been slow to respond to their needs. You know, I, I brought this up with the previous Minister of Agriculture when he appeared before the committee uh, more than a year ago, and still we are having the same problem. So one of the things that we're looking at, we know that for many farms, they've established a very long-term relationship with many of their employees. Some of these employees who, who are coming up as temporary foreign workers, in fact, have a decades-long relationship. And while we want to ensure that all of the appropriate labor and safety standards are in place for each farm, I think there's a number of things that we can do to really tackle this. First of all, I think there has to be a pathway to permanent residency for long-term workers. They have to show that they have value in our Canadian communities, that uh, because of the years that they've been coming up, they are in fact a trusted person and we want to take their skill set and make them part of the social fabric of Canada. Also, I think there has to be maybe some kind of a pilot program which looks at trusted employers. So if a farm uh, or, or an employer can demonstrate a verifiable track record of having the highest safety standards and treating its employees with, with care and due diligence, then I think that person can get probably a check mark beside their name as a trusted employer. And thirdly, of course, the, the, the audits and the incredible amount of paperwork have added a ton of stress to producers, especially those who are dealing with perishable crops. Uh, if there's an ability to maybe share workers, if one farm is having a, a, a weak delay in, in harvesting its crops but they know a neighbor who needs one, I think these are all sort of innovative strategies that we need to consider. And it has to be, of course, uh, done by and with the consent of farm groups who, who will give us that valuable feedback as to whether the program is working or not. Thank you very much, Mr. McGregor. Monsieur Bertold, vous avez deux minutes. Merci beaucoup. 
Two minutes. Thank you very much. I don't think there's a candidate on this stage that would deny that there's a major and chronic labor shortages, both on the farm and with food manufacturing. We, of course, do need more workers, and our foreign workers' plan will be unveiled in short order. So I can't reveal what the good news is that awaits us, but I recognize that there are problems, serious ones at that. And I know that uh, members in the previous government saw that the, in, in, the increasing growth in demand, producers that have come to knock on our door and say that the red tape uh, is too burdensome, uh, they, that there is too much bureaucracy. For example, look at apples. Apples don't wait for the uh, official to send the uh, certificate or the, the paperwork because it'll go rotten in the meantime. And this is a serious issue that all parties need to be con cognizant of, that we are fully cognizant of, and there'll be some very uh, important proposals being brought to the table by the Conservative Party. Now, we've had the opportunity to speak with a lot of foreign workers. We have to stop seeing them just as a source of labour, as a folks that have come from abroad, they are they have come with their families to earn their livelihood, to improve their daily lives and their own personal plight. And in doing so, they help the Canadian economy too. They deserve our respect. They deserve a warm welcome. They deserve to be treated properly. And of course, officials need to, in fact, uh, uh, if they see an error in their paperwork, they shouldn't tell them they have to tear it up and start again, which would jeopardise their, uh, their, their existence in Canada. And we need to recognise their contribution from A to Z. You know, producers uh, are currently filling their demand for next year, so there needs to be an understanding of how agriculture works. No one can deny the chronic labour shortage that uh, is particularly striking in uh, the agriculture and agri-food sector. There are a number of solutions to address this issue, that is to promote uh, uh, farming jobs. There are wonderful jobs uh, uh, that have to do with farming and agriculture. We also need to enhance the uh, tax measures uh, of four uh, farmers, and uh, we've seen some of those in our recent uh, budget. Uh, seniors, for example, who would be able to stay at work and would get, a, 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 in effect, a, p a portion of uh, their uh, income that would be tax-free. So enhanced measures to encourage our seniors to remain on the job and, of course, enhance uh, the uh, temporary foreign workers' programs. Conservative regarding the temporary foreign workers' program and the demand has exploded since then uh, because of, of the real, I mean, lack of labour. Uh, so we quickly eliminated the four-in, four-out rule that they had put in place. Uh, we have put in place instead a pilot project for non-seasonal agricultural workers with a pathway to permanent residency. We have supported the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council to, for them to provide more information, training and tools to uh, the employers put in place the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot Program. So we are really investigating in different ways how we can um, proceed better with our uh, temporary foreign workers and uh, have, have a, a pathway to permanent residency to find a solution, a long-term solution. We also, I think it's a good opportunity to talk about the importance of diversity within the sector. So uh, we, uh, for example, have put in place um, a fund of $500 million to support women in agriculture, and we have doubled the credit available for young farmers. Thank you very much, Madame Bibo. Ms. Story, you have two minutes. The roots of Canada's farm labor shortage go back to 1969, when a government task force report called Canadian Agriculture for the 70s recommended that farmers be told to get big or get out of farming. And every government since then has followed that same path. And now farms have been consolidated too much. The agricultural workforce is gone. The people are not in our rural communities to do the work. <coughs> so government in this, its wisdom, created this temporary foreign workers program to fill that labor gap, except that it exploits desperate people who have no human rights. And that cheap labor, 
undercuts the family farms who are still doing their own labor, or at least trying to pay fair wages. Greens will eliminate the temporary workers' low-wage program, which is nothing more than modern-day slavery. That idea that you can bring desperate people here to do hard labor for minimum wages and then claw back a third for housing and more for services and deny them health care and send them home if they object is just wrong. Where there are real labor shortages, Greens will increase immigration, working with employers to establish paths to permanent residency, but tying that to a the necessity to achieve working conditions and health benefits and wages acceptable to Canadians. Greens have also designed a guaranteed livable income program, which will help all Canadians make ends meet, but be especially effective in rural communities where job opportunities can be seasonal so often. The temporary foreign workers program is just a band-aid it's nothing more than modern-day slavery. It has to go. What a lack of respect. What a lack of respect for the, our producers. A lack of respect. Do you think really that they are treating their workers as slaves? This is unacceptable. I must say, I will not... I, I just don't know how to, do, to say it because it's not real. Producers you, are treating the worked? people really, really good now, and it, this is just not true. Have you worked for 15, 16 hours on a farm. We for have less norms. Than we have wage. rules in Canada and they respect it. And oh, if I, they this were is followed, this is we incredible. Be an argument. But this they is are incredible. Farmers. What are you they are not What are you some, here for? Uh, are, are my colleagues what are you here trusted for? farms? Well, that implies that some farms So are you not mean that most trusted. of our farms are untrusted? I'm not uh, saying most. Shocking. I am just just I, am well, saying I am shocked to hear you say that. Uh, yeah. On several occasions this evening, you have attacked farmers. You have. This is a support for small farmers. It's shocking. It is shocking. It is shocking that you are putting all producers in the same basket that they are poor environmental stewards, uh, poor stewards. Uh, of the labor market, of the workforce, and now you're saying that they're treating uh, immigrant workers as if they were slaves. It's shocking. No, no, you attack directly the producers, and this is unacceptable. put the people in farming. I know them. I know producers. They are good persons. They are good people. I think Mr. McGregor wants to get in. Incredible. I think Mr. McGregor wants to get in. I think some of the terminology used was definitely problematic. I mean, who's worked 15, 16 hours on a farm? I have when I was a teenager, because that's the reality of working on a farm. Sometimes you have to get the crop in. No one here is arguing against absolutely strong safety and labor standards exactly. but we have to remember a lot of these workers have decades long relationships with producers and they are in fact earning more in a day than what they would earn in a week but back at home. But they have no human rights. And, 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 and no that, 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 that is our time. Miss, Miss Story, Miss Story, we're out of time. Thank you. Miss Story, we're out of time. Well, um, that's one way to end a debate. <laughs> this, this concludes our debate tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you all for watching at home. On behalf of the CFA and tonight's debate sponsor, Food, uh, food oh shoot, sorry, I forgot closing <laughs> statements. Never mind. Um, keep staying stay with us, please. Uh, we need to do closing statements. Um, Mr. Bertold, <laughs> uh, you have a minute to uh, to do your closing statement. I, I, I apologize to all of you at home. This is my first first you, go at this. Uh, <laughs> you bring my smile back. Thank you because okay. I was so um, angry. So, Mr. Bertold, we have one minute for a closing statement. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Well, listen, voters have a choice to make, one that is clear. Do we want uh, four more years of the Liberals? Uh, who don't make agriculture a top priority, or a Conservative government that will make agriculture and farmers their top priority and give it back its seat at the Cabinet table. An urban government who is placing production and agriculture beside, or a Conservative government who will put the agricultural sector in the heart of their decision. We saw what they did, or what they didn't do, with all the uh, China crisis, with India, with Vietnam, with Italy, 
on a vu des mauvais accords. Et... We've seen terrible trade agreements and Canada's sovereignty that has been renounced in free trade agreements with the United States and uh, supply management. It's high time that we give farmers a voice around the cabinet table, and this will be done by Andrew Shear and the Conservative. Statements, please. It's too bad that what you have left after the last time you were in government uh, doesn't align with what you just said. So. Once again, thank you for having organised this important debate. It was an opportunity to share our ideas and to demonstrate just how the Liberal Party of Canada has made agriculture its top priority. I'm very proud of what this government has achieved to date, and I can reassure you that we'll continue to work together, hand in hand with the industry, by building on the progress that's already been made. shared priorities of CFA's producing prosperity movement including economic growth and prosperity of the sector, a diverse offering of high-quality, safe, uh, safe food to feed a growing population in Canada and abroad, ensuring we continue to benefit from clean air, water and soil for generations to come. Let's not go backwards, let's choose forward and continue to work in a transparent, collaborative way to realize Canada's potential as a top provider of safe, healthy, and sustainable food. Thank you, Madame Bibo. Ms. Story, you have a minute for a closing statement. Thank you. I want to thank every farmer who's watching. Please consider voting green this time. Greens are serious about what we're proposing. We can regenerate soil. We can treat farm workers fairly. We can reduce emissions. We can have strong, prosperous farms and strong, vibrant rural communities. We can put the people back into agriculture. It's time to find common ground where we can all work together because Canada is one family. We argue, but we talk after. We become friends. Farmers, business people, Canadian people, we're all one family. And every Canadian cares about a farmer who's worrying about making ends meet. Every farmer cares about Canadians who want to have good quality food and a clean environment. We all have to work together, argue, find solutions, and move forward together. Thank you, Ms. Story. And Mr. McGregor, you have a minute. It's been a real pleasure and honor to be here standing with my colleagues tonight because, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed when I joined the Standing Committee on Agriculture was just how nonpartisan most of these issues are. Uh, tonight's debate, with an exception, we are passionate about these issues. No matter if you're a conservative, a liberal, a green, or a new Democrat, we all come from areas that have farmers living in our ridings. My own riding on Vancouver Island, Couch and Malahad Langford, has a long and storied history in agriculture. And I often look to my local farmers for advice on what kind of policies sh we should implement. Do we have all of the answers? No, because this is a dynamic industry and the, challenge to the challenges are always changing. But what I can promise you, uh, what I've always done and what all New Democrats will do is to be there to support our agricultural workers, our producers, because you really are the backbone of so many rural communities. We'll be there. We see you, we hear you, and we will be there for you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And now it's time to conclude our debate. Uh, so this concludes our debate tonight. On behalf of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture and tonight's debate sponsor, Food and Consumer Products of Canada, I'd like to sincerely thank all of our, tonight, all of our participants tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, for those following on Twitter, again, you're welcome to share your views by using the hashtag AgDebate. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope you have a great evening. Mm -hmm.